Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, the 19th of September. The weather is warming up. There are more and more opportunities for us to, to get outside, to enjoy the good weather, to enjoy time with our friends and our family, um, not just as a church, but, but, but in all the groups and all the, all the places that we involve ourselves in throughout the week. And as we do those things, we find ourselves stepping into that places of community. And where there's community, there is intimacy. There's a sense in which you know and trust people with, with, with who you are. And, and, and they trust themselves to, to who you are as well. And as we do that, I'm reminded today that the book of James, the letter of James, is an invaluable asset for Christians in thinking and praying and living out community. So you saw the reading at the beginning of the video. James chapter 3 verses 13 all the way through to chapter 4 verse 8. It's a big uh, reading. There's a lot in there, lots of different images, lots of different admonitions. So we'll try our best to navigate through everything James says, but then pay particular attention to one or two important things, specifically that last part about, um, about asking, receiving, and asking correctly, because I think that's quite, a, quite an important and relevant question uh, in the world today. So, with all that said, let's quickly run through our reading from the beginning. So, last week we had James chapter 3 verses 1 to 12, the famous, famous part where James says, if you're a teacher, you've got to watch your tongue, because the tongue is like a fire. It is like a small flame that can start a devastating and destructive wildfire. And, and, and we spent a good deal of time talking about what James is advocating for behind all the language about the tongue being so destructive is, is a fundamental integrity and an, in, and an integrated identity that all Christians need to adopt and need to make their own. Um, and that ultimately for James, when push comes to shove, if what you say you believe and how you live don't align, then you cannot call yourself a disciple. Today, the words he will use is, is friend of God, then you're a friend of the world. So I say that to say James builds on those images and on those admonitions in today's passage. So he begins by saying, who's wise among you? Who truly has wisdom? This is his way of engaging his readers, much the same way as we might do if a, if a preacher were to walk up onto the stage on a Sunday morning and look at his congregation very seriously, look them in the eyes and say, tell me, who of you really considers him or herself wise? Probably not many hands would go up. Because on some level, I think we're all aware that wisdom is something that is, that is abstract and that is intangible um, and that perhaps, perhaps those who say they're wise are the first that we need to suspect of, Nick, of ignorance. But in any case, that's how James starts us off as well. His reason for doing so is to create a, a balance, or perhaps a better word is a contrast, between what he considers right wisdom, good wisdom, wisdom from above, and what he calls worldly wisdom, knowledge. You know, uh, it's not so much wisdom as it is simply and an understanding of how things work. He spends quite a bit of time contrasting these two things. And what we learn from the contrast that he creates is that the people he's writing to, the communities in the different places, these new communities of disciples, they had so many of the same issues that we have in our own modern time. Discord and envy and gossip things that are ultimately earthly, unspiritual, unspiritual and, 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 and in some way enemies of the truth. James says, says quite clearly that if you have this kind of worldly wisdom, you must know one thing, you are essentially placing yourself um, as an opponent of truth. And by truth, James will refer to, to the gospel of Christ. In contrast to this worldly wisdom, which, which, which works in all these things that we don't want in community, James also gives us a picture of what wisdom from above does. Wisdom from above is pure and it is peaceable and it brings peace and reconciliation and it brings uh, participation and it brings forgiveness and it brings love and grace and all these other things that we, that we truly do associate with a fully and healthily functioning body of Christ. It's always so refreshing to 
to be reminded or to remember that the people James is writing to were in many ways different to us in the language, in the culture, in the way that they saw and thought about the world and perhaps in a certain sense about their own roles in the world. But on another level, on a deeper level, they were not that different to us after all. They struggled with the same things, feelings of jealousy, feelings of unfairness, feelings of things in life being fundamentally outside of our control and that's why you've got to try to game the system with this worldly wisdom to stack the cards in your favor and James knows this he knows this is how people are and yet he implores them do not stack the cards do not play the game of worldly wisdom submit yourselves to God so that you may be instruments of his wisdom from above James has this incredible ability to, to, to direct our focus upwards in our relationship with God so that we may better understand and work in our relationships with the people around us. James is a book that really has its feet firmly planted on the ground. I've mentioned this a few times in, in the previous few weeks, but James is not a book that mentions God as much as, for example, the letters of Paul. Certainly doesn't mention Jesus Christ as much as the letters of Paul or Peter or any part of the New Testament. But nonetheless, James has this ability to mention the people in community with us all the time. This is something that is of central concern to him because he cares about community and because he knows where people live and love each other intimately, there is going to be conflict. There are going to be expectations that simply cannot be met and aren't met. There are going to be people who have such high ideals of what they want this community to be, the leaders for example, that the failure to reach that ideal is something that undermines the whole operation and the whole new fledgling community of, of believers together. This is why he talks about wisdom in such a practical sense. We often think of wisdom as an abstract thing. We often think that uh, wisdom is determined by the amount of knowledge you have or your level of education or even your life experience. But James almost says that wisdom, the wisdom from above, the wisdom we want, really has nothing to do with those things. That wisdom comes from the dwelling of the Spirit of God within us. And ultimately that Spirit and that wisdom is fundamentally practical and fundamentally interested and in working towards the improvement of our relationships with each other. This is why James says, if I can put my glasses on and read it from, from, from chapter 3, this is why he, he tells the community and tells us as well uh, in chapter 3 from verse 17, the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. James is saying that you will be able to measure the source of the supposed wisdom you have in your community by the effect it has on the relationships between you. If it brings peace, and mercy and a willingness to yield, if it drives away partiality and hypocrisy, then you know it is the wisdom from above. If it brings jealousy and if it brings gossip and if it brings that real spirit of animosity between people, then you also know that it is the wrong kind of wisdom. And practically James is saying you should be weeding out the wrong kind and you should be planting and nourishing the right kind. Now as we move into chapter 4, James really gets, gets to the nitty-gritty of not only today's uh, message but of, of, of his whole letter. I sometimes think it's such a shame that sometimes we break small short letters like the letter of James up uh, into these little snippets that we only have on Sunday and then the next Sunday and then the next Sunday because really we need that, 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 that long lens look at what the whole book is trying to say. Because here he gets to something that he has been building towards 
since chapter 1. These conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? This is chapter 4, verse 1. Do they not come from your cravings that are, that are, that are at war within you? You want something, <laughs> you do not have it, and so you commit murder. This, um, this might be something that jars us upon first reading. We're not, we don't live in that kind of world necessarily here in Australia anymore. But we cannot deny that this kind of thinking was a part of not only Israelite existence, but global existence for many, many centuries. If you wanted something and there was no other way to get it, you killed the one who had it, and then it became your property. And you covered something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You sue each other for its possession, or you bother each other, and you don't leave each other alone, and you undermine and you sabotage each other's endeavors because you want what someone else has. And then we come to a part that has given the church many, many headaches for many, many centuries. Verse 3. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in, on, in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Now this ask has been translated and has been, perhaps a better word than translated, is it has been transformed in our collective imaginations into something of the process and the act of prayer towards God. Fundamentally, I think, yes, James may be saying that this is about asking for things in prayer, but let's not separate what he has just said from the whole preceding chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. He's talking about people. He's talking about relationships. He's talking about what we might call church councils and worship teams and a morning tea service team and the people who greet at the doors and the Sunday school teachers and everyone else all in between. He's talking about disputes between ordinary people like you and I. And he's saying, this is a sign of that worldly wisdom between you that you covered something or you want something, and instead of engaging in the right kind of wisdom-filled, spirit-filled endeavor and relationship with the person who you want it from, you go behind their backs, you try and sabotage, you even, you even commit murder. You do not receive because you do not ask. And you do not ask because you ask incorrectly you ask wrongly before we talk about what that means in the life of prayer let's just stop for a second and think what that means in our lives together if i want something in community and we must remember the people who lived in these communities had a much more communal collective egalitarian idea of what it meant to be a a group of, of, of christians together than we necessarily do they shared their possessions. They shared their lives. They were much less interested in privatizing their positions than we are. And James is saying, in that kind of community, if you want something that badly, what you must do is you must engage with the person who has it to ask or to, or to bargain or to simply plead or to state your case or to say how badly you need it. And that's no guarantee that you will get it, but at least you will preserve the relationship. But if you go behind each other's backs, if you engage in legal disputes and conflicts and sabotage and undermining each other, then there's no way to repair the relationship between you and that person who possesses the thing that you want. Never mind the fact that the people James is writing to know very well that the Ten Commandments say you shall not commit murder and you will not covet any possessions. You ask and do not receive, because you ask incorrectly. You do not only ask for the wrong thing, you ask for the wrong thing in the wrong way, so that you may spend it on your selfish desires. Now here we might for a moment move back into that vertical relationship between what James is saying is our own individual faith 
and God. Because the problem and the danger and the warning is that we do this in faith as well, and in prayer specifically. We ask for things, but the motivation behind why we are asking is often so that we may only spend that which we gain on our own selfish desires. And so, if the deepest desire of your heart is for recognition, then if you pray to God to give you that promotion at work, or to be elected onto the school council at your school, or captain of your soccer team, or whatever it might be, then you are only spending the thing you want to gain in asking for it in prayer on your own selfish desire, which is to see yourself lifted up. And chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 will tell us, God has a funny way of laying low the proud and the arrogant and of lifting up the oppressed and the humble. God has a funny way, Jesus says this many times in the Sermon of the Mount, of prioritizing the peacemakers over and above those who seek to elevate themselves at the expense of peace. God has a funny way of caring for those who weep and cry and do not have enough, instead of giving those who ask for things simply so they may be elevated and satisfied and fulfilled what they want. And so perhaps, if we can speculate, James is saying two things. The one is, you must ask each other for what you want in proper, intimate, responsible, and loving, spirit-filled relationship with each other. You must prioritize the health of the relationship. But this also happens in prayer. When you ask God for things, but your motivation in asking for it is incorrect. You simply want it because you want it. Not because you think that is what God is doing in your life. Now I know, and all of us know, that the thing I have just outlined in asking for things in prayer so that you yourself may be somehow fulfilled or satisfied or lifted up in, the, in its attainment is different to the kind of asking in prayer that we, that, 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 that we tend to do, that we must do, when we are at the end of our tethers and do not know what else to do but to pray for some kind of outcome or solution to whatever it is that is plaguing and ailing us. When we pray for our loved ones to be healed from their sickness, or when we pray for someone who has been in a terrible accident to pull through that dark night in which we don't know whether they're going to survive, when we pray for someone who has lost their job in our current environment where it is so difficult to find a job and to hold on to one, when we pray for those things and we truly leave our own selfish desires at the door and simply ask that for the sake of the one who is suffering, that is a different kind of prayer in and of itself. And I think if James were to write about that kind of prayer, he would say something completely different to what he's saying now. One of the most disturbing things that I've ever read in, 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 in theology is a book by Tony Campolo called Choose Love, Not Power. And there is a passage in this book, Tony Campolo is a, is a sociologist, so he, he understands human dynamics and group dynamics, but he's also a pastor and a, and a deep Christian thinker and a counselor. And he tells and he writes about sitting with a woman who has suffered miscarriage upon miscarriage upon miscarriage. And he is, he is providing counseling for this woman and he's hearing her life story. And she's telling him how at her previous church, a woman was appointed as one of her mentors, spiritual mentors. And when she shared the story of her multiple miscarriages with this, with this mentor in the church, the mentor simply turned to her and said, well, have you been praying to God to not give you miscarriages? And the woman said, well, yes, of course I've been praying to God to not give me miscarriages, to give me healthy, healthy conception and, 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 and pregnancy and birth and healthy children. And the mentor simply said, well, have you been ending your prayers with the words, in Jesus' name, amen? Because you know, if you don't end your prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen, 
then God won't do it. You've got to pray correctly. You've got to pray in the right way. Now, I read it in a book. You can imagine how shocking it must have been for Tony, who wrote the book, Tony Campolo, and for the woman telling it in that moment to have gone through. To have someone who is also a confessing disciple of Christ sit across from you and tell you that your deepest, darkest suffering is down to you not, to you not ending your prayers with the right four words. And people often do that and they refer to passages like this. To James 4, they say, well, you do not receive because you do not ask correctly. And I think we should put a, a plug in that kind of thinking as soon as we can and say that's not what James is talking about. James is talking about principally human relationships, human asking, human giving. And then if he is talking about the asking in relationship with God, he is imploring us to remember that so many times in the day-to-day -day things we ask, we are, we are always tempted to be concerned with our own self-fulfillment and self-upliftment, first of all. And he's saying, be careful that you do not fall into that trap. But he does not here speak about the deep, deep longing of our souls that is revealed in deep and solemn and dependent prayer upon God. That's a sermon for another day, I think. The reason I say that is if I can put my glasses on again and just finish off the, the last part of chapter 4. It's because James wants us to remember from verse 6 to verse 8. God gives all the more, well, I suppose I should start at verse 5, my mistake. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives us all the more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, brothers and sisters, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. James is here not talking about the deep lament of our hearts in prayer. James is here talking about the everyday living with and amongst each other as a community that takes the Bible and takes God and takes our identity as disciples seriously. We can have another sermon on how we are supposed to pray for these deep laments and these deep longings of our hearts. But that is not what the text here is showing us to. If we can conclude, James started off by saying there are two kinds of wisdom and make sure you practice the right one. The wisdom from above that brings peace and a willingness to yield and opposes partiality and hypocrisy. He went further and said, remember, in relationship with each other, it's important that you do not murder or covet or sabotage or undermine or go into disputes and conflicts for things that you want and you are willing to, to, to throw every relationship under the bus to get it. He goes further and says, if you are a friend of God, you cannot be a friend of the world. And if you are a friend of the world, you cannot be a friend of God. We're back to James's big focus on integrity in faith. That what you say and what you think and what you read and what you sing on Sundays is ultimately how you live your life. Because for James, that kind of wisdom is practical. And for James, prayer is practical and asking is practical and relationships are practical. They're not abstract. They're not things that float around in the air. They're things that happen every day. They're messy and they're risky and they're dangerous. And the more you engage in intimate relationship with people, the more you open yourself up to being hurt and the more they open themselves up, up to you hurting them. And that's why he will say, draw near to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you, but draw near to God, cleanse your hearts and cleanse your hands so that you may be deeply in tune and in step with this wisdom from above that is enabled by the spirit of God that lives within you. Perhaps to end, we'll pray. 
and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, the way Jesus taught us to pray. And you will see that in the Lord's Prayer, so many of the things James is saying about relationship are also contained. The Lord's, the Lord's Prayer is not about self-fulfillment or about self-upliftment. The Lord's Prayer is actually not about me as an individual at all. It starts with our Father, not my Father or my God or my desires or my wants or my needs. So let's close our eyes, pray the Lord's Prayer, and then give each other the benediction of the Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the pure and good and gentle wisdom of the Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen.